Grass. A man once approached a group of farmers in a field and said to them, Brothers, have you seen a good man pass this way? I am seeking my master, who, not long ago, has come before me along the path. The farmers said, Yes, such a man of impressive countenance yet simple manners has indeed been here. Look, there is the mark of his foot where the grass is flattened. The seeker bent down reverently and picked a blade from the turf and held it admiringly in his hand. The farmers laughed, and one said, See, he thinks he looks for the direction of his teacher, but really venerates a piece of grass. This man was so annoyed, so hurt was his vanity, that he imagined that by this well-meant and relevant rebuke the farmers intended discourtesy. Instead of learning from the event, therefore, he said, Not one of us here is as honoured as this blade of grass, for it has touched the master's feet. What had hurt him was the implication that he himself was a fool, not the suggestion that his master was less important than he thought him to be, for no such intention nor statement was present in the farmer's words. And the farmers, for their part, now felt themselves slighted by the charge that they were less than grass. Their original benevolence towards the seeker evaporated, and an argument started. It is because of such tendencies that seekers are called seekers, and not finders. Prospects Ramida agreed to talk to sixteen visiting dervishes in one afternoon. One of his neighbours said, I regard you as a saint. You give your kindliness unstintingly and abundantly, even though you have other and pressing affairs to attend to. Ramida said, By insisting that they can be seen at their own convenience, they have obtained satisfaction but no advantages. My affairs have been delayed by half a day. Their prospects have been postponed perhaps by years. Had I declined to see them, they would not have fared worse in the area of reality. The Mirror, the Cup, and the Goldsmith A certain goldsmith worked for many years to perfect a magic mirror and a cup. The chief properties of these articles were that the mirror showed which of one's friends was in any trouble, and the cup enabled the user to dissolve troubles by dropping a pebble into it. It could also make one rich. The goldsmith, however, was unable to use the magical mirror and cup because they could be operated only by a certain kind of man. Desiring to make his discoveries available to whoever could use them, the goldsmith journeyed far and wide seeking a recipient for the magic treasures. At last he found an engraver of Bokhara with the necessary characteristics. To him he gave these objects, saying, Make good use of these. I shall return one day to see if they have brought you fortune. The first time the engraver looked into the mirror he saw the goldsmith struggling in a whirlpool, about to drown. He threw a pebble into the magic cup, and soon saw that the goldsmith was saved. The second time he looked into the mirror, the goldsmith was seen to be surrounded by dangerous and concealed enemies. By the use of the cup the engraver was able to dispel them. The third time that he looked into the mirror he saw that all the goldsmith's friends, associates and family were in all manner of difficulties. Again, by the use of the cup, the engraver was able to effect their rescue. When he looked into the mirror again, the engraver saw that he was himself threatened by difficulties, so he threw a pebble into the cup and his problems vanished. Many months later, when the goldsmith returned, he found his mirror and cup gathering dust on the engraver's bench, and the engraver was still working away at the fine work which was ruining his eyesight. He was incensed. I have been to so much trouble making these magical objects. Then I had to find a fitting recipient for them, he fumed. 
and yet you neglect them and put them aside as if they were nothing. You do not even use them to succor your friends. Why have you not made yourself rich? The engraver said nothing. For how could one reason with a man who, rare skills or not, jumped to conclusions without thought or due inquiry? He picked up the magical cup and a pebble which lay beside it. By this time the goldsmith had become so enraged that he was waving his arms threateningly and calling the engraver all sorts of names. Fumbling a little with the objects because of his poor eyesight, the engraver allowed the pebble to fall into the cup. The guardian of the cup, seeing the goldsmith in a threatening posture, made him disappear, and he has never been seen since. The Onion There was a time and a country in which onions were rare, almost unknown. Someone left a large onion standing in the public square of the principal town of that land. The citizens, or many of them, were interested in this curious object. They could see that it was some kind of vegetable. The first person to venture near it coughed by chance as he approached. He immediately went away to teach that onions cause coughs. The second found it had a strong smell. Although he wanted to take some of it, he said to himself, If the outside is as strong as this, then the inside must indeed be impossible to bear. So he left it alone. The third man made a cut in the onion. One layer came off in his hand. Miraculous object, he said to all and sundry. This has magical qualities. You cut it and it discards the whole of its outside, leaving an inside which is just the same. The fourth man stripped off another layer. He took it away, cooked and ate it. He found it delicious. Then he taught others to do the same. However many layers you bear away, this amazing vegetable always presents you with another. This is a kind of perpetual harvest, they exclaimed. Someone remarked, It seems to be getting smaller. That is sheer optical illusion, said the others because they wanted to believe that the onion was everlasting. And when the last jacket had been ripped from the onion, everyone exclaimed, Undoubtedly a magical but yet a treacherous thing, this. It can not only disappear, but does so without any warning at all. They all agreed, as indeed was the most sensible thing to do, that people were better off, on balance, without onions. Time. Several people went to Simab and found him silent. They went away, afterwards telling everyone whom they met that he was lazy and worthless. Certain of Simab's disciples went to him and said, Your repute is suffering because you have not attended to those people as you do to us. Simab said, What would you have me do? They said, Give them something of what you give us. Simab said, The motive is honourable, but the possibility is absent. Shall I give them what I give you instead? Do you want them to be served to the extent that you will leave me and let me attend to them? Or do you merely want them to be silenced, so that you will not feel uncomfortable in being called the disciples of an unworthy person? The Wand In some cultures, miracles are effected, in legend, by waving fairies' wands. In others, there is the spirit of the magic ring. The objects vary. Sometimes they are swords, for instance, sometimes cups. They originate from strange supernatural creatures, variously named. People have always been curious about these objects, and have indeed sought them far and wide. But why is it so difficult to find them? 
Why can one not seem to be able to make contact with the creatures who make or operate these wonders? I shall tell you. You may even believe me. Once upon a time, when this kind of story was first used, the sages who told them used to say clearly what the objects were and who the creatures were. But this information so conflicted with all human beings' imaginings about magical objects and powerful creatures, and so affronted them, that they turned upon the tellers, and many were killed. Since then the identity of the creatures, and the real nature of the objects, has always been concealed well enough to prevent easy interpretation, and to cause the more destructive people to sneer at the whole idea as primitive, ridiculous, spurious. If you want your food to be safe from the greedy, tell them that it is poisonous. Better still, let them suppose that they are clever enough to discover that it is harmful or useless to them. The Sun and the Lamps Someone said to Jan Fishan Khan, What we have heard of the concealed activity has been rumoured for centuries. But it is an extraordinary thought. Why is it extraordinary to you? asked the Khan. Because it postulates that, in spite of the thousands of visible centres of studies of the Sufis, nevertheless these are nothing compared to those places which we cannot recognise, because they do not have the appearance of shrines, tombs of saints, or abodes of wisdom. Jan Fishan Khan said, it depends upon the viewpoint and where you are looking. The visible places of Sufi study are like lamps in the dark. The inner places are like the sun in the sky. The lamp illuminates an area for a time. The sun abolishes the dark. If you do not conceive of this, you will naturally be surprised when you hear it. But the surprise is no greater than if you were night people who for some reason never ventured out of sleep during the day. The night people, knowing darkness, see lamps partly because darkness is present. To those who seek light, light itself is perceptible without darkness to display it. The Goat there was once a country where goats were almost unknown. That is to say, everyone had heard of them, but so far no goat had ever been brought there. Because of this, everyone was much attached to the idea and thought of goats. The lack of real information about goats had not prevented the scholars of that land from collecting, sifting, comparing and enlarging upon whatever scraps of information there were about goats. Those who, not unnaturally, became obsessed by goats were known as the believers. As a result of the intellectual and emotional life centering upon goat study, everyone believed that there was a great deal of knowledge available about goats. Some were even sure that the last word on goats had been said. One day a man crossed the border into this fascinating land. With him he brought a goat. It is ours by right, said the goat-worshipping priests. It is ours to study, said the goatological scientists. It is ours to eat, said others who could not think of any other claim to make. The owner of the goat was amazed. He said, How can it be yours, for any purpose at all, when it is mine? If you are so excited about it, buy it from me and let me go. Someone shrilled, How can anyone sell anything as important and rare as a goat? It was decided, for this and other reasons, that the animal was not a goat at all. This must mean, of course, that its owner was a fraud. It looked like what they had heard a goat looked like, but this must be spurious. The scholars and jurists decided that the man must be punished, and he was put in prison. The goat was placed on a platform to test its supernatural qualities and also to receive the respects of the populace. 
Deprived of food, it languished and died. This proved that it could not be a real goat, and that it was useless to the people of that country. The Imbecile Teacher a certain Sufi received a young man who had many opinions but few experiences. When they had spoken for an hour or two, the other people present noticed that the Sufi was speaking more and more obtusely. Presently, the young man, unable to restrain himself, was calling the Sufi an imbecile. When this youth had gone on his way, several people begged the Sufi to explain the reason for his behaviour but he simply smiled and said nothing. Some even imagined that the Sufi was becoming so old that he had been unable to hold his own with the visitor. One day, when an illustrative story was needed, the Sufi returned to the subject. He said, Some of you will remember that there was a day when a youth came here and I behaved like a stupid old man. The fact is that he was moved only by opinion and had no current ability to admit experience. It was beyond my power to cross the barrier raised by opinion. If I had tried to explain this to him, he would only have surmised that I wished to criticize him. He needed information, not knowledge. Malumat, not marifat. As a host, I had an obligation. The obligation of the host is to give the guest what he desires. The only service he would permit me was to bring out his auteur and to increase the manifestation of his crudity to such an extent, regardless of my appearance, that he might be able to observe his own difficulties and abandon them. The Fool There was once a man who did one thing right and one thing wrong in that order. The first thing was to tell a fool that he was a fool. The second thing was not to have made sure that he was not standing beside a deep well. 